he's recently orange filled and uh, he sees the potential for Bitcoin to transform Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So we talked last time and it was a great discussion about, you know, what is money? Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm, I'm trying to accelerate that message with, with politicians and it, teach them what money is because I think that is actually the best avenue to get them to understand Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand what money is, then you don't really see the potential for Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? You see it as a technology mm -hmm. or maybe just a, a stock even, mm -hmm. right? But it's far more than that. It's a transformation of very fundamental parts of civilization. But I tell them, you know, money is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is money. And now what that means is money is is energy and information. Mm -hmm. And if you have energy, you're a rich nation. And that usually gets them very mm -hmm. interested. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Samson Mal, World Wide Breedlove. Welcome back to the What Is Money Show. Thank you for having me. Nice to do it in person for a change. Yes. Uh, we are in Miami at Bitcoin 2023. On the last day of the conference, I think we're all a little bit wiped. <laughs> uh, currently having some caffeine and waiting on some caffeine for you. Just by way of quick reintroduction, you are the CEO of Jan3. That's right. Um, maybe just tell the audience a little bit in case they don't know who you are, what you guys do at Jan3 and, and who you are. Sure. Jan3 is a Bitcoin company focused on accelerating hyper-Bitcoinization. So my background is uh, Bitcoin exchanges, mining pools, and infrastructure. Previously, I was the CSO at Blockstream, and before that, I was the COO at BTC China. So right now, we're just trying to get more Bitcoin adoption top level and bottom up grassroots. So grassroots, we're supporting new initiatives in different countries, trying to get new Bitcoin beaches, Bitcoin jungles going. Top level, we're engaging with politicians and governments, trying to help them define a Bitcoin strategy to bring them into the financial future. Super cool stuff. Very important. Orange pilling of nation states. Um, not enough people working on that. <laughs> Has to be done. Yes, it does. Um, okay, let's talk about nation state adoption and some political candidates you mentioned and i'm not going to pronounce his name correctly probably ridden kamal ridwan kamal ridwan kamal who's the governor of west java yes in indonesia which is a jurisdiction of like 50 million people in it 
um you're working with him on him orange filling him what's what's going on with that guy all of the above yeah okay so he's recently orange filled and uh he sees the potential for bitcoin to transform indonesia Mm -hmm. so we talked last time and it was a great discussion about you know what is money Mm -hmm. but uh I'm I'm trying to accelerate that message with with politicians and it, teach them what money is because I think that is actually the best avenue to get them to understand Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. If you don't understand what money is, then you don't really see the potential for Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Right? You see it as a technology mm-hmm. or maybe just a a stock, even mm-hmm. right. But it's far more than that. It's a transformation of very fundamental parts of civilization. But I tell them, you know, money is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is money. And now what that means is money is energy and information. Mm -hmm. And if you have energy, you're a rich nation. And that usually gets them very Mm -hmm. interested. Mm -hmm. In the case of Indonesia, he's well aware. It's a very energy rich nation. Mm -hmm. They're the second highest in terms of geothermal potential in the world. They have, I think, 2,000 some odd megawatts of geothermal potential. They have 800 rivers to tap into for wow. hydropower. And with that transformation of money being energy, you're a very rich nation if you have that. Right. So they just need ways to tap into that. And of course, he's also interested in the concept of a Bitcoin bond. Mm, interesting. So that's a great poetic framing even, right? He said money is energy and information. If you've got energy, then you are a rich nation. Yes. Very simple, uh, even rhymes. Yeah. Um, what the geothermal potential of Indonesia? I guess they're in the Ring of Fire, right? So it's the most volcanically active place in the world, I believe. Yeah, is it the geothermal potential is from vol? Is it volcano mining? Is that what we're talking about? Or is this just it actual? Would be. Oh, it would be okay. And they're already doing a public-private venture to do volcano mining. Okay. What is, so geothermal is where you dig straight into the ground yeah. and harness Earth's thermal energy. That's right. What's so the you, difference between that and volcano mining? It, it's just mining with that energy. It's like a, a brand gotcha. for geothermal powered mining facilities. But yeah, you drill these wells down and you um, take the water out in the form of steam mm-hmm. and you power turbines and then you put it back down the well. And actually you can get energy when you push it back down as well. So it's, you get energy taking it out and then you get energy putting it back in and you just convert that to Bitcoin. So when you can't export that easily, right? Like where where would they, if they built a, a large array of geothermal plants, mm-hmm. what are they going to do with it? They can't send it to Australia. They don't mm-hmm. have a neighbor mm-hmm. that will buy from them. But if you can turn that energy into money, you can sell it. Right. The other interesting thing is I tell them, even if you don't want the Bitcoin, you can simply sell it. Yeah. If you value gold, if you value dollars, it's there for you to take. Right. You just take the Bitcoin and sell it. It's the most liquid market on the planet yeah. with some $40 billion of trade volume daily. Mm. So it's almost irresponsible not to tap into that yes. and take it, build roads, build hospitals, build airports, yeah. whatever you need. Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. I would like to, I'm just reminded right now of the analogy you used last time for a nation state of a hotel, right? Like, yeah. like it needs to, I guess, provide certain amenities and a certain level of security to its customers. Um, and it does seem kind of like extremely low hanging fruit. If you have unused or underused energy resources that you can now turn that into money, globally saleable money in a 24 by seven market, that's basically irresponsible, right? If you're not harvesting that, but what, so that seems extremely obvious. What are the, I mean, what are the impediments to getting people to that realization? Is it just the fear and ignorance related to Bitcoin or or what are, what are the roadblocks? I think it's really just education. Like we say this very often, Mm -hmm. but it is education. A lot of the times when we engage with these politicians, some of them have no understanding of Bitcoin and you have to start from literally zero. And you need people going there and being Bitcoin ambassadors and helping to educate. So in Indonesia, there's a friend of mine, Bobby, Mm -hmm. uh, Robert, also Robert. And he's uh, running uh, Bentos and he's been doing a lot of great work there. He's 
that partner that's helping them set up their mining operation. Mm -hmm. And he's also doing educational work as well. But it's just up to us to go there and support these grassroots initiatives as well. Like um, there's a Bali Indonesian conference, Bitcoin conference mm -hmm. that's going on in October and you're invited. Mm -hmm. But um, these things are going to help accelerate that understanding of Bitcoin because you're going to have local people going to meet Bitcoiners, listen to them talk about Bitcoin, get orange pilled. And that's really the only way. It's just proof of work. There's no easy solution to get a million people or in the case of Indonesia, 270 million people ramped up overnight. Right. It's going to be a lot of work and a lot of people talking about Bitcoin to them 24-7. Right, right. Is the what is money question, is that instrumental in your orange pilling of these individuals? I think it is. I mean, it really comes down to changing their thinking about Bitcoin. There's just so much misinformation and FUD in the media mm -hmm. that it's difficult to combat that. It's easier to just say, Bitcoin is money, mm -hmm. right? Sailor likes to say Bitcoin is a commodity, but I like to go even simpler. Bitcoin is just money. And that generally gets them understanding faster because it is. It's whatever you want it to be. Bitcoin is just information, really. Yeah. It's just we happen to use information as money or use a commodity as money. Right. Well, that's very interesting. Are they drawing examples or inspiration from El Salvador? Because the first time I had heard of volcano mining was post El Salvador. Is that a model that they're emulating or, or in any way drawing lessons from? I think they're definitely looking at El Salvador. Mm -hmm. Like all eyes are watching and seeing how they're developing. So success in El Salvador is good for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And I think all the work that people are, have been doing there, you know, the Bitfinex guys and uh, Max and Stacy, mm -hmm. that's great. You know, mm -hmm. keep that running because that is a, a beacon that we can point to and we can look at El Salvador and see what they're doing, mm -hmm. right? It's also critical because with Bitcoin as legal tender in El Salvador, it opens the door for other things we can do with other countries, mm -hmm. right? Guatemala can adopt Bitcoin in an instant because they have a law that allows the use of foreign currencies mm. and Bitcoin is a foreign currency. Mm -hmm. So hmm. El Salvador is very important in the grand scheme of things, but we do need more countries to adopt it. So the head of operations at Jan3, uh, Dugi, he likes to say El Salvador is a beachhead. Mm -hmm. We have a small foothold and we need more of these mm. because as you know, the powers that be want to roll out CBDCs. Of course. We have to fight and counter that with Bitcoin. That's yeah. the only counter. That's a great point. Yeah, so Bitcoin Beach is our beach head then. Literally. <laughs> what well, I imagine you would be targeting then energy rich countries for this for the orange pilling, mm -hmm. um, since there's they stand to gain so much. I would say so. I mean, there are also groups in um all over the world, there's a group in the Philippines too. And the Philippines is also very high for geothermal potential. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to see because a lot of countries that are have been poor for a very long time or have you know low per capita income, they're actually very rich in terms of energy. Mm -hmm. But before Bitcoin, what can you do? Oil is great. You put oil in a barrel, mm -hmm. you ship it anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. But with geothermal and hydro, Bitcoin is a godsend yeah. because now you're a rich nation. You can be Saudi Arabia or the Emirates. Mm -hmm. And in those countries, they don't tax you, right? You're not taxed in the UAE. Right. You get paid to be an Emirati. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing I tell the politicians too, because most of them are looking for ways to increase tax revenue. But what if we pause for a second and rethink things? Why do you want the tax money? Obviously, you have public infrastructure you want to build. You need to finance the government, the military, mm -hmm. whatever. You need the money. But what if you didn't need to try to extract that from the people? Mm -hmm. What if you set up a mining operation and you're just mining the Bitcoin and fun financing it an entire country? Mm. And I think that's also a light bulb moment where they start to think maybe there's another way mm. because taxation has kind of run out of control. It's spiraling way, way out of control. Every single thing you're doing is being taxed. And then you have the hidden tax of inflation. Mm -hmm. So this can't continue. And this is contributing to the downfall of the world. Yeah. So Bitcoin fixes that. Wow. So there, it's, I mean, wow, that's interesting. So 
Bitcoin can offer a totally new model for a nation state to finance itself. It exactly. can then radically lower taxation, uh, a la UAE, as you described. Mm-hmm. And then that draws in foreign direct investment, talent, et cetera. Yeah. So that's an interesting take. What Are there other things besides um, being energy rich? Are there other things you're looking for in countries that you would try to target? Is it uh, a certain disposition towards technology or perhaps a certain form of government that maybe lends itself better to the orange filling versus not? Well, I mean, we're agnostic and we yeah. try not to uh, be too political. We want to engage with whoever is interested in Bitcoin. Um, we don't want to be known as, you know, uh, allies of uh, uh, strong supporters of any one particular country. And yeah. we just do that one. We want to be accessible as a resource to talk about Bitcoin. And nothing that we know is unique. Like this is all information on the internet. We mm-hmm. just make an effort to package it up and deliver it in a digestible format. Right. And we're happy to answer questions. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. Looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, The device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, Like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, It's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, the Gold Investment Letter. The Gold Investment Letter helps sophisticated investors navigate capital markets and maximize their profits in trading gold, silver, and mining stocks. The Gold Investment Letter seeks out the most undervalued companies and identifies special situations in the mining sector, and then provides in-depth analysis on both their financial positions and future prospects. The Gold Investment Letter explores many complex domains, such as investor psychology, portfolio management, and macroeconomic trends, all with the goal of making you a better investor. The Gold Investment Letter offers a free version and a paid premium version, and I strongly recommend you at least sign up for the free version, because after having read a few of these issues, I can promise you it is a treasure trove of good information. You can sign up for the free newsletter today at goldinvestmentletter.com. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance, you got to have some insurance. You got to, there's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. And I give a company some money in case shit happen. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Is game theory ever part of these discussions? Like, because obviously as Bitcoiners, we've often thought that if one nation state or central bank starts to acquire Bitcoin, this would trigger a competitive response from others that could get out of hand very quickly. Kind of like a game of musical chairs. You want to be one of the first to sit down. Um, Is that a component of these discussions ever? Definitely. And I think some Bitcoiners may be disappointed that it hasn't kicked off right away with El Salvador. But I believe it takes time mm-hmm. because there's still cognitive overhead to overcome right. in regards to Bitcoin. But I believe it's coming and it's coming very quickly. The other interesting thing is just looking at the political landscape. So uh, working with my team at Jan3, we're always very uh, analytical about 
the political situations and re-elections in different countries. Mm. But if you look at what's ca- happening in the next two to five years, actually one to five years, there's going to be new presidents and prime ministers in a number of countries, mm. Indonesia included. So Ridwan, there are talks that he may be the next president or vice president of Indonesia. Mm. And that's very interesting. And all over Latin America, elections are happening this year and for the next several years. So this will change the landscape. And a lot of these candidates are starting to look very seriously at Bitcoin. Mm. And we're working with groups all over the world to engage with some of these politicians that will likely become the next leaders of their countries. So those countries which have a lot of energy resources or countries that would look to lower their total effective tax rate and thereby draw in foreign direct investment or talent, et cetera, um, seems like there's a lot of advantages to be offered to, uh, and people, we've been talking about this for a long time, but it seems like it's just now starting to get real. Um, these ideas that I guess have just been abstractions in the minds of Bitcoiners are now starting to permeate policymakers' minds. Yeah. Um, how do you, if you had to look forward in terms of timeline, how do you think it plays out? Obviously, I'm not going to hold you to this prediction. Um, do we see... We all, clearly we have El Salvador so far. I think we have uh, the nation state of Bhutan yeah. mining Bitcoin. There's a few other rumors that some other countries may be mining. And um, how do you do? We have major nation states putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet, or or states sponsoring mining in the next decade, two decades. How do you how do you see that? Well, yeah. Well, we know El Salvador is mining. Mm-hmm. They've got their mine at La Heo. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's their geothermal division of their national ut- utility. Mm-hmm. Uh, Costa Rica, they have a private-public partnership already with a data center. With data center plus, it's a a little hydro plant. Mm-hmm. So Costa Rica is technically mining Bitcoin already, and Indonesia as well. So you already have four. You have Bhutan mm-hmm. and El Salvador, Costa Rica, and uh, yeah, the fourth one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's been a long conference. Sorry, that's always hard after the third one. I found. Yeah, I like three, and then if I got to name a fourth, I'd just say the fourth one. <laughs> it's been a long couple of days, but yeah. anyways, the point is, it's happening. It's just not FOMO yet, mm-hmm. and I think that will come. So your question about the timeline is, I would say within the next five years, mm. we're going to see a wave of adoption, and definitely within ten years, we will see hyper Bitcoinization, mm. and even independent of Bitcoin adoption and the efforts and uh, things that everyone is doing, it would just happen because the other system is breaking. Yeah. Right? This is just fuel on the fire. The yeah. Bitcoin adoption push is just adding fuel to that fire. That's a great point. So you think then by, you said 10 years, so 2033, we're in hyper-Bitcoinization. Yes. Wow. It's going to be a wild decade then. Um, I th- I had a public prediction that U.S. dollar would be hyperinflated by 2035, so that's pretty pretty close to that. Yeah. And you're right; like it, you don't even necessarily need net demand on Bitcoin to increase that much when you have fiat currencies failing, and you just denominate Bitcoin in a failing fiat currency. That starts to look like hyper Bitcoinization pretty quickly. Yeah, interesting times. Okay, um, anything else on? Nation state adoption, or should we pivot to another topic? We can pivot. Okay. We're talking about the security trade offs for hardware wallets and self custody. There's recently been some drama with Ledger on their recovery product. Um, as I understand it, it's you're basically trusting a third party, right, to recover your self custody keys in the event that you lose them. So you're giving up some of the self-sovereignty, the traditional self-sovereignty aspects of pure self-custody for some redundancy effectively that, you know, some idiot proofing maybe, if I could use that term. It's a lifeline if you lose your seed. Right. And so clearly it's it's a trade-off. It's a security trade-off, right? You're giving up some control or sovereignty for some redundancy or or backup. Um, What are your thoughts about that thoughts on the drama thoughts on uh security trade-offs and is this good bad what do you think well it's it was not rolled out very well Mm -hmm. i think they didn't understand their current audience so the offering of ledger recovery 
is not necessarily a bad thing if it was some new device that everyone's opting into from a fresh start. Mm -hmm. Because we have to understand, like, not everyone is technical. And as we go towards mass adoption, there's going to be billions of people that are not going to be able to successfully back up their wallets and mm -hmm. store everything. I mean, people still use passwords with a capital P and 123 after, mm -hmm. right? So there is a market for that. And I think it's fine for them to serve that market. I actually think banks of the future will become part of multi-sig quorums mm -hmm. or ha having a cold key custody, mm -hmm. right? That's basically the kind of bank that serves Bitcoiners, right? Yeah. Maybe some lending too, but it's not a bad product, but it was poorly rolled out, poorly communicated, and it's nearly not for their customers right now. Mm -hmm. It could be for future customers. But I think the other thing that caught a lot of Bitcoiners off guard was they just assumed that this type of thing was not possible, right? But you have to understand that uh, hardware wallets are not the end of security. Mm. Like you don't just buy a wallet from uh, Ledger, Cold Card, or Blockstream, or Bitbox, and you're done. The, you have to understand, like you're saying, there are a lot of trade-offs with different things. Different wallets have their own trade-offs, yeah. right? The software and hardware stacks. So not the software that you install, like Ledger Live or whatever. Yeah. Internally, there's also various pieces of software right. that make the wallet itself function. Firmware and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. These are all engineered at varying levels of quality, mm -hmm. right? It's not the same and most people don't know that. Mm -hmm. But the architectures are also full of trade-offs. So you have a secure element, but secure element is not foolproof, right? Like mm -hmm. it looks like with Ledger, the, the seed can leave the secure element. And I think other hardware wallets too, the secure element does not do computation mm -hmm. of the Bitcoin signing curve. Mm -hmm. So it sends it to the MCU, which is the processor. Mm -hmm. So technically, the key can leave the secure element. And then there's critique of uh, Blockstream because it doesn't have a secure element, mm -hmm. but it's a different model. So that it has a pin server, which is remote. So you actually actual key is not in the device. So if you assume that if my hardware wallet has that secure element, I put it in a drawer, mm -hmm. I'm good forever. That's wrong because over time, secure elements can be compromised and there are techniques to extract key material from these secure elements. So mm -hmm. in that sense, having it with a pin server that's decrypting that seed is actually safer. Mm -hmm. But the best solution is really multi-sig. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't trust any one vendor. Right. Your assumption out the door should be, I don't trust any of these guys. Yeah. I don't trust NVK, I don't trust these guys. Yeah, yeah. And you do a multi-sig and then you limit your risk because yeah. you have a four or five or a three of five or whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, I often share that on this show. Like if you want to realize the full value proposition of Bitcoin, you've got to get into a multi-sig or what they're now calling a multi-key setup. Mm -hmm. um, but you're basically diversifying your exposure, right? Where if there's any one hardware failure or counterparty failure, then you should be okay because yeah. you're not just in one key. Yeah. Um are there is there are there best practices other than if multi-sig is kind of the best custody schema we have today, are there best practices that you recommend for people or or resources on multi-sig? Um there's a, probably some good guides out there. I've personally used Electrum and mm -hmm. Spectre. Mm -hmm. I know Sparrow is spoken of highly, but I haven't used it myself, mm -hmm. so I can't say anything. But um, those three are top of mind. And for us at Jan3, we think we'll go down the road of creating some of these clients too that will help facilitate multi-sig down the road. Right. But um, best practices are use multi-sig. Um, seed signer is good too. There's uh, also trade-offs too, because you know, seed signer is brilliant, but you have to keep your 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 seed QR mm -hmm. somewhere yeah. that's accessible if you want to sign, right? Yeah. Um, another thing is passphrases. People can use those as well because that adds another layer of security. So you have your hardware wallet. You might have a physical metal backup, mm -hmm. but then if someone finds that medical metal metal backup, they can access your Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So what you want is a a passphrase that mm -hmm. you put somewhere else or you memorize. Mm. Right. Right. Okay. So an extra layer there. Uh, b back to Ledger, though. So there was a lot of drama about this rollout. You said... There's always drama. There's always, especially in Bitcoin, right? People are mad about something all the time. 
they perhaps rolled it out, um, it could have rolled it out better, let's say, um, didn't communicate, doesn't sound like all of the implications of the recovery product um, as well as they could have. But it is an opt-in feature, right? This isn't something they like pushed out to all of their customers. Uh, is well, that correct? It's to be seen. It's a, a firmware update, so you could not install the firmware. Mm-hmm. But the whole point is you have to kind of stay current with the firmware or right. else you could be bricked. Like I've had to do forced upgrades yeah. on, on ledgers before. And if you don't upgrade, you can't use it. Mm-hmm. So it's optional to a point gotcha and I think that's what people were really upset about in, in addition to the botched communications right? right because they said different conflicting things and they went back and forth and then deleted one of their other comments so it's still very unclear exactly what this beast is right were there applications for identifying customers like were KYC or otherwise well to use the service you would have to KYC ah okay and potentially that means they could be subpoenaed to Mm -hmm. put your seed back together somehow Mm. but it's still very unclear about all this but it's not really that bad I mean it's a a custodial service Mm -hmm. just in the form of a hardware wallet Mm -hmm. so there's nothing to be upset about because people still do use custodial services Mm -hmm. a lot of them are very very popular Mm -hmm. but I think it's just very bad communications and it's still not clarified yet interesting Okay, let's shift gears again, unless you got anything else on that. I'm good. Okay. (laughs) Liquid and Lightning. Um, A lot of people are very excited about the Lightning Network. Um, It seems to resolve a lot of the issues that people complain about on Layer 1, which is Bitcoin's not anonymous, it's not fast enough, um, it's not extensible or flexible enough from a developer standpoint, and Lightning seems to maybe not fully solve all of these things definitely seems to solve transaction throughput should the network continue to proliferate you pick up a lot of degrees of anonymity maybe not pure anonymity but it's a lot better Mm -hmm. Um, and then it's much more flexible from a development standpoint Um, but lightning is not the only higher order layer protocol being built on top of bitcoin we have others such as liquid yeah what is it you mentioned offline that there's like a derangement about liquid? Uh, it's an irrational dislike of liquid. Okay. So Fetty is a hot thing. People love yeah. Fetty and Fettiments. Yeah. But that's really just another liquid network, right? And it's a liquid network that you put together with your friends. Can you explain that? Like, because I I somewhat have an idea of Fetty. I know Obi and I've, He's, I've heard the pitch and seen the whole thing, but I'm less familiar with Liquid. So can you explain how they're similar? So they're both federations. Uh, one is a federation of your friends and one is an enterprise level federation made up of companies. Mm. So Jan3 is a member, a number of other companies are members like Mempool Space and uh, Hoddle Hoddle, Bitmanex. There's 60 companies that are members of Liquid. So Liquid is basically Fetty, but more robust and more guarantees of uptime because it's run by hardware that uh, the functionaries, which is the guys running the boxes, they have in their data center. So you have very high levels of uh, uptime assurance. Gotcha. And then what? why? Why is there derangement about Liquid then? People are so excited about Fetty. I'm not sure, mm. but um, some people just like to hate on Liquid and they're not very cognizant of what they're saying. So someone was telling me there's somebody on stage yesterday kind of dissing Liquid. They dissed... Uh, Wiz from Mempool and said he he does liquid stuff like kind of in a derogatory way Mm -hmm. but then he was excited because you can put Bitcoin in a custodial Mempool account to boost your transactions or accelerate your transactions later Mm -hmm. but you're kind of uh, excited about custodial Bitcoin service but you don't want to use a federation Mm -hmm. but at the same time maybe they like Fediment so it's kind of very uh incoherent this Mm. is like for liquid and i'm not sure exactly why but liquid serves a very important need Mm. which is stability at a a second layer lightning is great and don't get me wrong people like to put it like it's lightning versus liquid Mm -hmm. but that's not the case it's lightning and liquid Mm -hmm. there's a service called peer swap which lets you rebalance your lightning channels using liquid Mm. and that hasn't gotten traction yet but i think it will because i think people are starting to understand that you need a way to balance your channels quickly. 
And you can't really do that with main chain Bitcoin easily, mm-hmm. right? And also the recent um, wave of spam from the ordinals guys, mm-hmm. right? That boosted the uh, the fee rates and everything. Mm-hmm. That kind of showed that Lightning is brittle. We had a lot of forced channel closes. Mm-hmm. So Lightning is not a final solution for everything. It doesn't fix everything and it's not perfect. There are still deficiencies with Lightning. Uninformed, but it seems like it's just more demand for block space, which means fees go higher and more development gets pushed to layer two and more layer two developments, more reservation demand for Bitcoin, which is number go up. So like, I don't care what people use Bitcoin for. Like that's the beauty of it. You want to make fucking wizard hat JPEGs or whatever they're doing? Like go for it. (laughs) Who am I to tell you what's good and bad use of block space? Sure. I think it's, it's weird that, um, Bitcoiners are shooting all over these people like oh you shouldn't use it for that it's like says who like why do you why does your value judgment get to override someone else's well that, we can get into this yeah it's philosophical I think yeah I think so um okay there's been some very hot debate I guess about the new ordinals and inscriptions stuff on bitcoin um seem to create a bit of a schism in the community some people think it's positive you know they like to see bitcoin being put to use for other things or there being demand for bitcoin uh, in other capacities than just money let's say and then there's another cohort in the bitcoin community that thinks it's a really bad idea the idea of putting jpegs or nfts or what are these brc tokens i think is what they're there's called. a lot of these there's a yeah. brc and a something R a C S R C and then yeah there'll be more yeah yeah so um i mean the view that i've shared with you earlier is basically i just see it as new demand for bitcoin as something kind of other than money right people are using it for these other purposes and all demand for Bitcoin block space is, is good for Bitcoin, as far as I can tell. Um, that's my sort of high-level uninformed opinion. I'd love to hear your views on the matter. Yeah. So I'm not fully informed. I think I understand enough, but I'm not deep into it and I've never run the software. So I'll just preface with that. Mm-hmm. But my view is it's kind of a, a sort of spam on Bitcoin. And there is debate on is there such thing as spam if they're paying the fees? And the example I like to give is like, you know, someone paid their internet bill, but they can still be an email spammer and load you up with stuff you don't want, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, you can pay your fees, but it's still spam if it's unwanted because it's a bit different than getting email spam. If you want to run a full node, you get all this stuff Mm -hmm. anyways, all this junk. And there's talk about pruning it and uh, Mm -hmm. clearing it off the chain uh, because it can be pruned. But the biggest thing I would say is ordinals are kind of extraneous to Bitcoin. It's not Bitcoin. They like to say it is, but it's really not. The whole system is another piece of software you run. And that is tracking these movements of the ordinals, right? Mm. The only thing that you have in Bitcoin is data stuck there, pictures or whatever. And the other thing too is why do you need to stick a picture in the Bitcoin blockchain? If there is a need for it, Um, to be censorship resistant I don't see why not right you could do that and people have done that in the past this just made it easier Mm -hmm. but you know if it's uh, an important image to preserve for historical reasons sure but uh, they're basically putting you know monkey JPEG series and generative art and all this stuff Mm -hmm. and the reasoning for that is not to preserve something or you know to to uh make some historical significance it's really just to say it's it's a marketing point mm-hmm. it's it's immutable it's in block it's in the bitcoin blockchain mm-hmm. and um when we inscribed it it was uh this price and mm-hmm. because of high fees now it would have cost us millions and millions of dollars to inscribe these now therefore they are expensive mm-hmm. so in a way it's all a construct to sell something mm-hmm. and that i think is why people don't like it plus they don't like the people behind it but that's a right, right, right. <laughs> that's yeah. another topic yeah. but At the end of the day, Bitcoin is designed for financial transactions. And yes, you can do other things with Bitcoin, but there is also a truth that there are stupid ways to use Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. You can do it, but should you do it? Like I can park my car and take three spaces, 
Yeah. But that's not that nice. I might get a parking ticket, but that doesn't mean it's the right use of that space either, right? Yeah, I paid the fine, so I can do that. Right. But it's still not being a good citizen. And there's also a cost too. Yeah. So for people living in affluent countries to run a full node, yeah, you probably have money to buy a hard drive. But this does make it harder for people in developing countries to run a full node, mm. right? There is a cost and that cost is being accelerated. What is it that makes it more difficult to run a full node just because there's more? More UTXOs, yeah. more data to sync, okay. and more hard drive space requirement. Okay, gotcha. But it's obviously hasn't changed the block size, but it's just changing the total data to download the blockchain is now there's more data being put on the blockchain essentially it's bloating the utxo set okay. and it's accelerating the increase of block space usage mm -hmm. so i think with uh segwit we increased to four mega megabyte weight size right mm -hmm. so we should assume that that will be used in full eventually but it's sort of artificially being used in full now by junk so mm -hmm. It's not like we don't want block space to be filled. I think everyone understands that eventually the the fees that people pay will sustain the security of the network. Mm -hmm. That's a given. It has to happen eventually. But the question is when and for what reason. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use, all of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin, and for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, today to sign up and use discount code breedlove okay so nvk was making this point the other day that the a silver lining of this debacle is that it totally squashed the block subsidy debate yes where people have been saying oh well what happens when the bitcoin block subsidy goes away as we approach 2140 will transaction fees be sufficient to secure the network yeah if not they could cause this cataclysmic collapse blah 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 but now, clearly, that's sort of been proven that it's a non-issue, at least yeah. over a short time horizon. Um, first, like, do you agree with that? And then second of all, have, have there been other silver linings to this, this saga? Well, I think NVK is right there. It mm -hmm. does show that uh, Bitcoin will sustain itself over time. Mm -hmm. I was actually thinking it's not a big deal, even if this wasn't demonstrated, mm -hmm mining should eventually become a critical activity for nation states and you know technically a nation state doesn't need to pay for power the power is free it's part of the right. land the country part of the monopoly so right. it's not like you're fighting to get cheap power if their nation states are mining they'll just mine because they're part of the network and they want the bitcoin mm -hmm. right and that will generate as we talked about before revenue for the country mm -hmm. but the other part is there were people that wanted to add inflation to Bitcoin, mm -hmm. tail emission basically, mm -hmm. after the subsidy mm -hmm. um, to pay for security. Mm -hmm. And I think this shows that you don't need to do that. Right. But that could have become a contentious debate mm -hmm. because there are prominent people saying we need a tail emission, we need inflation in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But 
again, this is a good thing and that shows block space will fill yeah. and fees will pay, be paid and that will cover security cost. Yeah, that's definitely a win in my book at least because if you open the Pandora's box of tail emission or any inflation in Bitcoin whatsoever, Bitcoin's kind of fucked at that point because whatever it is, 0.1% inflation. Mm-hmm. Well, why not 0.2? Why not yeah. 2? Why not 5? Why not 50? Well, that goes right back down to the uh, block size wars, right? Yeah. It's a very innocuous thing like, oh, this block size, mm-hmm. nothing big. Yeah. But it opens that can of worm yeah. where, well, Bitcoin becomes malleable at that point. Exactly. Right? And tail inflation, I think, is a dangerous one because, you know, that's also critical for Bitcoin. Like We're compromising Bitcoin. the integrity of Bitcoin. Yeah, but it's a argument that people can get behind. Mm-hmm. Just like a lot of big blockers got behind, we need bigger blocks. Yeah. It's it's for the good of the network, mm-hmm. right? And this Dangerous. can also be for the good of the network too. Sounds like Marxist stuff, for the greater good. Yeah, for the greater good. <laughs> but the thing is, we usually don't need to do anything with Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. It will function fine in and of itself. Whether that is by design from Satoshi or just an accident, I'm not sure. But the design is just brilliant. Mm-hmm. And we don't need to change anything. That's the most important thing we have to understand. Like, I don't think we need to prune the or block ordinals. Those yeah. things will just die off naturally. Right. Because you're it's relying on a small group of people that are not very good at what they do to promote it. Mm. So once they stop their efforts and move on to another thing, it'll die off. It's almost like a shitcoin in a way. Yeah. Like shitcoins have a life cycle. They go up mm-hmm. once, maybe twice, and then yeah. they're gone. Right. So So you don't think there's any legitimate use case or product market fit that will be established for these Bitcoin based NFTs or JPEGs or whatever they are? Not really. I mean, you could, what you want is a timestamp. So mm-hmm. I said before, if it needs to be censorship resistant, maybe you want to put the Bible on, mm-hmm. that could make sense, mm-hmm. right? Or some significant historical things, mm-hmm. maybe. But if you just want it to be available for people to get in the future, there yeah. are probably better ways to do that than putting it on Bitcoin. And, and as we saw, fees will increase over time. Mm -hmm. So this will become very cost prohibitive. That's Mm -hmm. why it's very short, high time preference, Mm -hmm. right? Like you're not going to be able to inscribe ordinal collections in, you know, two to three years. It'll be just too cost prohibitive. You won't be able to trade them easily. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to happen because it's going to be so expensive. And this is why we have layer twos, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, what you really want is a timestamp or a hash of whatever it is that photo or a document and you could have done that already with open timestamps mm-hmm. like this is old tech but right. it was tech that didn't let people get rich you know Giacomo and Peter Todd were doing open timestamps I don't know 2015 mm-hmm. but that's not a way to get rich right selling wizard JPEGs gets you money wow gotcha okay so a shit coin has basically infiltrated Bitcoin in a way you could say that or I should a shit coining <laughs> campaign or something is now being built on bitcoin that's interesting definitely muddies the waters right there's there's always been kind of this bright line between bitcoin and shitcoin but now seems like it might be getting a little bit messy this is a a somewhat of a tangential question but there i saw this photo recently uh post tiananmen square massacre and it's a photograph that's actually banned in china Mm -hmm. like you can't it shows you know bicycles flattened to the road by tanks bodies in the street, et cetera, et cetera. Uh-huh. Um, do you think there might be a use for the immutability of Bitcoin's time chain to store data like that, like things that have just been you know, blacklisted from the internet or censored by a country? Um, could Bitcoin, could this be maybe uh, presaging Bitcoin's use case in, for something like that where you could store data in an immutable way or have maybe immutable records or immutable history immutable photos um possibly but it's very it's a very expensive storage medium Mm. so if you're going to do that you should choose something that is censored and not easy to send around or would be scraped off the internet yeah like speech is important and we should be able to preserve things that are important to human history Mm -hmm. Or things that people don't want seen, but you know it'll it'll cost you, yeah. And it's not going to be scalable. Like 
you're not going to be having these things issued 10 years from now. Right. And you're not going to be able to move them for very cheap. Right, right, right. What you want is something that is not on a blockchain, right? And there's like, these guys are almost like the big blockers in some way, which is like Roger's very thing. We have to pay for coffee on chain. Mm-hmm. Like we have to make the ordinal and whatever, whatever on chain. But actually off chain is the future. Mm-hmm. You don't want the blockchain. Mm-hmm. The blockchain is toxic waste. If we could have Bitcoin without a blockchain, that actually would be better. But we can't do that. And it's too late for that now. Mm-hmm. So we do have this artifact remaining. But this is the exact reason why we want to scale with layer twos and beyond. Mm. It's the the chain is actually a chain. It's binding us and it's expensive, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. What you want is sound money. Mm-hmm. You want immutable money and uncorruptible money. Mm-hmm. Does the market solve this? Though? So if we get more demand for block space that's driving fees higher. So that's going to incentivize people to push more of their transactional activity into layer two, right? Mm-hmm. If sending ten dollars in Bitcoin costs you fifty dollars, obviously that doesn't make sense. So you'll try to opt for lightning or some other layer two. If you push more transactional volume to layer two, that incentivizes more developers to build on layer two. And to the extent that at least something like lightning, the net the lightning network proliferates as a layer two technology, that creates you have to fund those channels with Bitcoin, right? So that's more Bitcoin not moving, being locked in those channels, which is less Bitcoin being sold in the market. So that's more upward pressure on the price. Um, Is that a net, I mean, it sounds like a net benefit for Bitcoin. And it sounds like, I guess at some point, these JPEGs that are being done on layer one would just go to layer two if it's cheaper. I don't know if that's even possible, but. um, I mean, you can issue NFTs on liquid. There's a, mm. a website that we helped operate called Baratoshi. It's a community initiative. It's an NFT website to patronize artists. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of artists want to play with the tech. They want to have an NFT. Yeah. They want it to be tradable too yeah. you know, and have royalties. Yeah. But unfortunately, they need to do it on Ethereum platforms or mm. you know, whatever. But we built this so that they could do it on a Bitcoin sidechain and not pollute the main chain. Mm-hmm. And they can still do everything else. And what you really want, again, is that certificate or that that hash, right? So where Toshi artwork is stored in um, IPFS. Mm-hmm. So it's not stuck in liquid chain either. It's just, you have that hash. That certificate is ultimately what you want. Mm. And it just happens to be that certificate or NFT is what lets you trade freely too. Does that inherit the immutability properties if it's done on a side chain like that? Well, art is not really immutable. You should reissue too, right? And a lot of these NFT collections, they migrate. So if you can migrate from one chain to another, was it ever immutable? Mm. Right. So as long as you can screenshot a JPEG, you never get the real immutability property. You can have a certificate, but yeah, the image anyone could download it. Right. Okay. So you just wouldn't have this. You'd have a bootleg JPEG versus the certified J- JPEG. Well, you the certificate would would still be if um if it's a copy, it's still a copy, but you at least have that proof of ownership, mm. right? So that's what you end up with. You, like there might be the certified one original NFT. The certification then, is that you bought it. Got it. Oh, just that you bought it. Well, if you get the, the if you get a JPEG yeah. and you copy it, it's still a perfect copy, right? Right. Does it copy the certification too then? No. Okay. So that's why the certification is what's important. Got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Again, I haven't played with any of this stuff, so I barely know what I'm talking about, but I was imagining like you get a, original Babe Ruth baseball card and it's got some kind of little hologram on it saying it's certified uh, genuine. Well, the certificate is what is showing that you purchased it, right? Mm. Or you did some interaction with the artist. Okay. But if you just copied that, downloaded the image off of Rare right. or anything, right. it's the same as the original one. You've got the actual image but not the certification. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, so good or bad for Bitcoin, this ordinals and inscription stuff? generally bad but silver lining hmm silver lining number go up will what silver lining number go up no silver lining is that shows you don't need inflation oh. fees will pay gotcha so you do you think it contributes to bitcoin's uh upward pressure on bitcoin price if it's pushing more development to layer two 
the thing is, all of these things will happen organically. Mm -hmm. Fees will rise organically. Uh, more layer two development will happen organically. And I think we're probably going to see layer threes mm -hmm. emerge and we're starting to see some of them. But um, layer two is too dependent on Bitcoin still, mm. right? We saw that with the fee spike and lightning is not working that well. At least non-custodial lightning is not working that well, mm. right? Custodial services were still okay. But um, we need to use things to further extend Bitcoin scalability. Mm. Maybe the next step is lightning on top of liquid. I don't mm. know. But liquid offers a layer of assurance and stability and it's still Bitcoin. Hmm. Interesting. Well, we will just have to keep an eye on all this and see how it plays out. Samson, I appreciate you doing this. Uh, great to talk to you in person for a change. Likewise. Uh, yeah. You do it again. We'll do it again. Um, where can people find you on the internet? I'm on Twitter. My handle's Excelion and same on Noster. Awesome. Thank you, man. Thank you.